the most important skill they should learn in getting into real estate or really anything, even acquiring businesses, yeah. is raising capital. If you don't know how to raise capital, you will always be limited to your own resources. You just don't know how to look for money in your own network. And it is there. This is what happened. I decided I'm gonna get into real estate, so I'm gonna go join a country club because I assume that's the only place that people have money. I've never got one person there to invest in anything I do. Let's say I raise some money. What are some mm -hmm. things I can do with somebody else's money? How do I get people to tell me whether they have money to invest or not? Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to the YouTube channel. I've got one of my favorite people on the planet, especially in real estate here with me, Matt Faircloth, one of my heroes, somebody I look up to and have looked up to for a very, very long time. I believe he's written the only book you should read on raising private capital. I talk about this book all the time. This is the old version. We're gonna be talking about the new version today. And we're also gonna be talking about what Matt Faircloth focuses on, how he got into this. But um, Matt, before we get started, I tell everybody, the most important skill they should learn in getting into real estate or really anything, even acquiring mm -hmm. businesses, yeah. is raising capital. That's right. Well, and, and the reason for that, is, and first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, if you don't know how to raise capital, right, you will always be limited to your own resources, right? You'll be, you'll be limited to your own bankability, uh, your own credit. You'll be limited to how much money you have in the bank or how much money you can scrape together at a, under your own name. Once you know how to raise capital, you'll be able, you can write the, whatever check you want to write uh, by soliciting it from your own network, even borrowing other people's bankability, right? Um, once you know how to do that, the world really opens up on the, on the size deals you can do. Yeah, what's interesting about that too is that you don't have to be the person that finds the deals if you are the person that knows how to raise the money. That's right. Yeah, you kind of got the keys to the kingdom. I mean, you know, we raise a lot of capital as as uh, as does uh, Pace's organization. So people bring deals to both our companies because they know that we know how to put uh, capital together. And it, it's almost like a, like a secret, but it's not a secret, right? Um, and it's not like Pace and I uh, were, uh, you know, both grew up in country clubs, right? You know, went to Ivy League schools yeah. and, you know, country clubs. And that's how we know people with money. Um, um, and that you know people with money as well, whether you think you do or not. And that's probably the biggest uh, thing I hear, Pace, when I talk to students and, and folks that I meet. Like, well, I don't know anybody with money, right? Uh, yeah. What? <laughs> right. Well, okay. Two things. If you don't know people with money, there's there's two truths, right? And one only one of which is true. Number one, if none of your friends, nobody in your network has any money that they should invest with you, you have a network problem. You need to go get new friends, right? Yes. And get in different circles of people because you become who you surround yourself with, right? right. So if everybody around you is broke and really cannot invest in your deal, which I don't think is true, but if that is true, then go get new friends. You're gonna just gonna become broke like that, right? But what I believe is actually the second truth, which is that you just don't know how to look for money in your own network. And it is there. There, are, There is literally trillions of dollars sitting around us that doesn't know where to go, that's looking for a home and doesn't realize that it can get put into, into things like what Pace and I do into real estate ventures, right? They just gotta know where to look. So I, um, this is funny, because before I found your book, again, I tell people, I, I was interviewed on Bigger Pockets a year and a half ago, and they asked me, what's your favorite book? And I said, your book. This is before you and I became friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I have always looked up to that book. It's up in my office. It's, on, it's one of the very few books on my shelf. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened. I decided I'm going to get into real estate. So I'm going to go join a country club because I assume that's the only place that people have money. How'd that go? <laughs> I've, been, I've, I've been in this country club now 10 years. Okay. I've never got one person there to invest in anything I do. <laughs> but you're really good at golf now. I'm pretty good at golf, <laughs> yeah. Um, so... I, what's funny is I joined the country club thinking, okay, well, I need to go where the money is right. because I had the same problem that you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is I thought nobody in my current Rolodex, my current family, friends, circle of influence, nobody had money yeah, because nobody was talking about it. That's right. And I also wasn't coached along with the right questions to ask. So I pick up your book. I read it. I had an, I remember in chapter six, I had an epiphany of like, I shouldn't have joined this country club. I went through through all this effort. Do I throw rocks at country clubs in the book? Oh, sorry. My gosh. <laughs> I, it just it wasn't the right mechanism for me. But by the yeah. time I got to chapter six and I started realizing the, what I should have been doing, you are directly responsible for leaning me towards the appropriate path that is, has helped us raise over a hundred million bucks. So thank you for it's that. Incredible. It's, what's incredible welcome, is that it comes from a book that you sell. Mm-hmm 
that you changed my life through that book. Mm -hmm. And not only did you change my life, but you changed all the people's lives that I've bought deals with yeah. and all my employees that have been done profit share with me on those deals, all because of, again, the book. The old version. The old version of this book. <laughs> so um, you wrote, when did you write this book originally? Uh, 2018. Okay, 2018. I picked this. I pick. I must have picked this book up the second it came out, mm -hmm. and I it changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. I tell everybody about it. I have always told people about it, and then here we are, come full circle. You now have the new version of the book coming out. Yeah, and I want to. We're not just here. Just just happen to be chatting with Pace about this. I'm super grateful to like throw some gratitude over at Pace. I'm lucky enough that Pace has written the foreword to this book. That that that, that you believe in in what in the technology I've put forth in this enough to put your own name and your own brand on this thing as an endorsement. And I cannot thank you enough. The book for that. changed my life. So I, yeah. I was very I, when they asked me, I was like, "Are you joking me? You're gonna <laughs> let me be a part of a book that changed my life?" So thank you first and foremost. Yeah. But raising capital, I think. The words raising capital are daunting, they're mm -hmm. scary. Yep. And for somebody just starting out, they don't even know what raising capital means. Yeah. So very basic. Yeah. If I'm watching this for the first time, I've never raised money before. Mm -hmm. One, what is raising money? Yep. And two, what let's say I raise some money, what are some mm -hmm. things I can do with somebody else's yep. money? Raising capital simply just approaching people in your in your own network and explaining how you do what you do. So you got to be a teacher. Number first and foremost, those that are really great capital raisers are great teachers because the reason why these folks don't already invest in real estate or don't have other ventures going is they don't understand. Yeah, I can't tell you how many people tell me, oh, I didn't know that was legal. Wow. But yeah, well, the financial planners, you know, are out there telling these folks, oh, you can't put your retirement account in anything else aside from the stock market. And that's it. Right, all these things are not true, uh, and it's our job as capital raisers to debunk a lot of the myths around these types of things and and uh, and that. So, it, it's about showing people in your network another way to build their wealth and help you build your business alongside it. And that could be by them coming into a debt position, aka loaning you money, you know, or coming into an equity position. Uh, Pace and I both do both of those in our businesses, and you guys can do both as well if you're able to explain the difference between debt and equity and how your investors protected, uh, and how their, how their precious money is, is protected in, in, uh, into your deals. Okay, so last night I'm on a Zoom yeah. with my, my students, and I had a student group, students came in, married couple, and they go, Pace, we just sold our dry cleaning business, we now have a bunch of money that we can start investing in real estate. Mm. And I yeah. go, here's what I would rather you do. Step one, go get Matt Fairclough's book. Yeah. I want you to read it because what you're going to realize is that you should leave your money to the sideline yeah. and you should go and learn the valuable skill yeah. of raising capital. Yeah. And they go, but we have our own money. Why should we go raise capital? Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. so, even if somebody does have their own money and they have the ability to go raise capital, what does raising capital do for somebody yeah. in, in, in real estate? Well, I mean, in, unless, unless you, I mean, you, you, great. God bless. They sold their, their business and everything like that. So they're probably sitting on reasonable capital put in, but let's say they're playing with a million bucks, right? Um, the size of deal that they could do, uh, or maybe if I were them, I would do multiple deals. Maybe I just buy one thing or they're just getting into real estate. The size of opportunity they could do would be this big, right? They are limited to what is in their bank account. But the exposure that they get, the exposure meaning the knowledge, the know-how, the network, the everything that they get uh, for themselves is this much bigger, right? If they go and raise some capital, maybe even in, if I was them in that scenario, I would go to an investor and say, hey, I want you to match me. I'll go dollar for dollar for whatever. Hey, so I've got my own skin. I'll go dollar into the deal if you go dollar into the deal, right? And then they can do maybe double, or maybe triple, maybe maybe you go to a few investors and say, I'll go dollar for dollar. So for every dollar you put in, I'll put in a dollar as well. If you've got your own capitals, a lot of times investors feel good knowing that your skin's in the game. It doesn't really matter per se, um, but uh, but that's that's maybe a way that I would arrange that because it could just take down a larger project or a portfolio of larger it's deals. It's so interesting. You know, the more I learned and more I read your book, I've probably read the book four or five times because I think a really great book is a book you're not quite ready for. Yeah. And I wasn't ready for the entire book. I was ready for like four or five chapters. Mm -hmm. Then I had to put some into action. And then I came back and I reread the book and I go, okay, now, now the, some of this stuff now makes sense that I've applied it. It, mm -hmm. it makes sense at a higher level. Yeah. The whole book made, a, made, made sense. The whole book changed my life when I first read it. 
But when I applied it and they came back and reread it, I was like, oh my gosh. Uh. What I'm getting at is it's interesting how many different ways you can structure a yes. deal. It's not just one thing. Like people will ask me now, thank you, based on what I've learned from you. People will ask me questions like, Pace, how do you structure your deals with your private money lenders? Mm -hmm. How yeah. So how do you answer that question? Well, I've even, I've even <laughs> went further. People have been like, hey, does the SEC tell us how we have to do equity splits, mm -hmm. right? Like the SEC says, you, like, you know, it, it's like it's written somewhere on the SEC's walls that, they, they, that you know, you have to give your investors a 70-30 split or you have to pay a 6% preferred return, right? right? No, that's what's beautiful about raising capital. It can be whatever you want. Uh, I, and that's what's great. And that maybe why Pace and I are aligned on this is the opportunity, the blank canvas you get with creative financing, with buying stuff subject to, with uh, the arrangements you have with your investors is open for discussion. It is whatever you want to negotiate. And then you put those things in writing and it can be whatever you want. Uh, we've done deals where we paid investors a flat rate of return, just a, a an intra, uh, just a interest loan. And we've also done deals. We built a, a string of houses in Philadelphia pace where the guy made a percent on, on his money and then he got a percent of the profit on the upside, a JV deal, right? So you just listed out three, in, in less than 30 seconds, you listed out three different structures. It's just, yeah. Would you say that you've probably structured a deal a hundred different ways? Yeah. With, and for every deal that I've done, there's it's, been a specific structure to that it, deal. It's very rare to see the exact same structure on any other deal. Yeah. Is that right? Right. It is because people, and, and my students have, uh, have come to me and said, hey, Matt, can I get a copy of your loan docs? I'm like, I can, but it's not worth anything to you because the loan structure you're going to negotiate with your investor, if you go investor first, and if you talk to them what they want, what do you want? You want monthly payments? You want upside? What kind of rate of return is, is meaningful to you? Uh, are we getting the money from an IRA? Are we getting the money out of cash? Is it coming out of real estate? All those things change the loan docs, right? It, you know what's funny yeah. is if you said this to me eight or nine years ago, mm -hmm. I would not have understood how every one of those little demographics would have differed based on what they want. Right. So like, for example, let's say I am a, I'm a school teacher. Yep. I've got $50,000 and mm -hmm. I, that person probably wants a monthly check. Yep. Okay. Versus somebody who's worth $20 million mm -hmm. is probably okay deferring their payment every month till you're mm -hmm. done with your project because yep. they don't want to be bothered with the monthly payment. And they want the upside. And I'll tell you what else, another, another factor, right? Let's say that somebody watching here has a IRA account, right? If the, an IRA is a former 401k. Just so you guys know. So if somebody has a day job, uh, you know, uh, and they leave that job, the 401k retirement account that they have is now an IRA automatically. They can roll it over to be a self-directed IRA, which then can get invested in our deals, right? The, the thing is, the IRA has its own EIN number, and it's, it's like money on the shelf that you can't touch until you retire. Currently, 59 and a half. I'm sure they'll increase it by the oh, time yeah. that you and I hit retirement age, oh, yeah. right? Um, but they can't touch that money. And so what's interesting about that is if they're putting that IRA into one of our deals, right, and Pace does that deal with this person, starts sending them a monthly payment, what he's done is created a problem for them, mm -hmm. right? If they loan him a hundred grand and he says, okay, I'm going to do 12% just because easy math, 12% interest, right? So a thousand dollars a month. Then they, they now have this thousand dollars in their IRA account. They go, what am I going to do with that? Right. I have to reinvest it. It's, it's what they call dead money. It's just sitting there and it's, you know, he's sending them a thousand a month they don't need and they can't touch, they can't enjoy. The school teacher that has $50,000 set aside, right? That school teacher, he or she can start taking that money and start enjoying it. Maybe they can go and take the 50K they give Pacer I and go and buy themselves a new car yeah. uh, on a lease payment, right? Maybe I can help them create a new lifestyle through the cash flow. But the IRA account, on the other hand, is what well, I structure those is I don't do monthly payments on, uh, on an IRA because you don't need it, right? right? Which you wanted you, great thinking, like way to bring this up. Yeah. If you, if somebody invests with you mm -hmm. through their self directed, mm -hmm. 100 grand. Yeah. And the structure is 12%, yep. like you said. Mm -hmm. So I get $1,000 a month. Yeah. Would, and they go, we, I don't want to pay me because it's a nuisance. Mm -hmm. I just want the $1,000 to stay in the deal. That's right. Does, does that $1,000 compound? You can, yes. It depends on the vehicle. So if you are in a multifamily apartment building asset, then you can't compound returns on a multifamily asset because it's only, you only raise, like, you raise 10 million bucks to right. buy a multifamily apartment building. 
it's not like you're adding new apartments to the multifamily. It's it's 100 units. And we're going to build more units as we go. So there's no place to go with the additional money. You can't buy any more right. of it. It's, it's, it's only this big. Now, if you're doing a fund or if you're doing a hard money loan arrangement like like we do, so uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll do hard money. And so they somebody loans me 100 grand. I've got the money for uh, six months. 12% interest again for easy math. So six months, I now give them 106 when the loan's over, right? So they now have 106 they can put back into my deal. There you go. Right. So they start recycling those interest returns back in. So you, the, the beauty of private capital and the beauty of IRA accounts is you can compound over and over again. There's a concept called the rule of 72, guys. Look this up online. It is a phenomenal rule. I talk about, people corrected me because in the book I say it was, it was from Einstein. I believe it was. People have said, oh, Einstein <laughs> didn't say rule 72. It was the eighth, eighth wonder of the world, compounding interest. Whoever said it, it's a great vehicle. And it goes like this. If you take the number 72 and you divide it by the interest rate you pay on an annually compounding return loan, that number you come up with is how quick the money will double. Ooh. Okay? So let's say 72 divided by 12. That comes out that comes out to the number six. Okay. Right? I'm I'm a dork and good with numbers really fast, right? So that's a recovering engineer. So that comes up the number six. If Pace gives me a hundred grand out of his IRA account and I compound that uh, compound that loan annually, in six years, you will have 200 grand, right? Paint this picture to all the folks in your network. All you guys know people that used to work at this job and now hopefully they got another job over here. And the job, the IRA, the retirement account they had at the job they used to work at is now ripe for the picking for you to put into your real estate deals while they work at their new job. And you can show them, hey, I can help you double your money in six years or five years or 10 years or however long you want to make the arrangement for. Which most people in their retirement account or even their self-directed, if they've rolled into a self-directed, most people are not even making any money, mm -mm. right? The people that are letting a financial advisor manage their money, they're actually slipping backwards, are sure. they? Or is that not kind of the, the standard? It's the way to look at it because, well, you don't see it. You don't see the backward slip, right? So you don't see like, oh, my my account with Vanguard or whatever it is, uh, oh, it's, it, you know, kind of had a bad year or stayed stagnant or whatever. And that's because it is growing, but it's growing for your financial planner. And there's so many fees <laughs> that aren't disclosed in those things, right? Yeah. I mean, Pace and I are required to disclose all the fees for the real estate deals that we do. And it's just good transparency, right? So for you guys, we, we, can, we uh, demand that you you guys disclose all your fees to your investors, unlike Vanguard, who doesn't, you know, and that. So the as the account goes up by 10%, the financial planner and Vanguard themselves take the majority of that. The investors left thinking the money's in good hands, but it's really going back to the financial planners and those entities, right? It's better to have transparency and have your money growing into a thing that is sticks and bricks, that's collateral, and it's perhaps something that they can drive by because maybe this investor is someone that lives in your local market yeah. and you can, they can drive by it and know that their money is making the world a better place and a fix and flip or whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. It's interesting. That's also goes into a marketing uh, strategy for getting more private money lenders or investors or whatever private capital yeah. is talking, having your investors talk about deals. So for example, something I took from the book, you know, talking about podcasts and social media is part of the book of like how to go out and get a brand so people mm -hmm. understand and recognize where you're at. Some of that is now common sense to me now, but at the time I was like, oh, I didn't think of creating a podcast to raise capital. One thing that is great is that I will bring now my private money lenders on my podcast yeah. and go, hey, how cool was it to go visit that property that you loaned me money on? And they go, oh my gosh, it was so great. I love being on the property. I felt like I, I was part of the whole entire thing. Because you were. And guess yeah. what they're doing? Yeah. They're now promoting and helping me raise capital on yeah. my behalf without me having to raise capital. Yeah. And I think that like it, it, from a holistic good feeling standpoint, they can look and see that. And I'm not saying that if they have money in a mutual fund that it's not helping create jobs. But them w walking around and seeing the property that Pace is renovating or the apartment building that I'm buying or whatever it may be is providing a juice to the economy because they can look and see it and touch it and see it either in the YouTube video that they shoot yeah. or, or or that. And it's it goes back to them knowing that their money's doing good. That on my website right there says transforming lives through real estate because I believe that real estate and what we do in, in our ventures through raising capital 
really helps make things a little bit better by me helping somebody achieve their financial goals. So just an alternative, nothing's wrong with Wall Street, but I wanna give an alternative to that just in case they wanna have their chips in a few different buckets and they wanna have their money do good. Their money, our money, the money we raise from our investors for Pace and I both provides jobs to people, right? We just did this, we just did this breakdown a couple of weeks ago. We found out that the average real estate transaction pays 59 human beings. Right, Appra appraisals, uh, a real estate agent, real estate agent, broker. It, we, we go really deep and we figure out who's repairing the property, who's getting it up and going. The contract. 59 people get paid on a real estate transaction. Think about that, guys. So <laughs> get out and buy a house, give some people some jobs. That's you know? exactly <laughs> it. Okay, so I'm new. I've never raised money before. I think people in my, I, I, I believe what you're saying yeah. is that there's two truths. Either A, I, I have no, I have, I have a bad network and I got to upgrade that. Right, right, right. Or B, I have people in my network that have money. So I'm going to choose to be believe B. And in this situation, what advice, what are some good steps for somebody that's starting out to go test the waters and see if people they have in their network have mm -hmm. money? How do I get people to tell me whether they have money to invest or not. Yeah, you make your money list, right? Uh, I already gave you, gave you guys the equation for a self-directed IRA. So hopefully you got your pens moving on your piece of paper, writing down everybody you know in your network, look on your Facebook feed, look at your cell phone for people that used to work at job A and now work at job B. They can be retired, it's okay. As long as they're not some sort of like a public service, school teachers, a lot of those folks have pensions, right? There's nothing wrong with those kind of jobs. It's just that if they have a pension, it's hard to put a pension involved into real estate transactions. But if they had a job for a, for a public company, Odds are they had some sort of retirement account, right? So that's number one. Number two, do you know 30% of America owns their primary residence free and clear? 30%. Isn't that's that crazy. crazy. Yeah. Uh, and so because of that, and then a lot of baby boomer generations do, and even baby boomer generations, like my like my mother and father walk around with like a badge of honor. We've paid our house off. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. we have no monthly payments. I remember the community back in the day where they, they would encourage people on how to accelerate their mortgage, oh, yeah. make double payments oh, yeah. and stuff. And they'd have this thing where people would go and burn their mortgage statements oh, and like yeah. this big silver bowl and stuff like that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, congratulations. Now you've like opened up the keys to the kingdom. Now you can take that free and clear home that you have and leverage that up and achieve financial freedom. Right. Right. But they don't realize that they think that they've crossed the finish line by paying their house off. Yeah. Right. Free and clear real estate is a phenomenal vehicle for you guys to put to work in your business um, by encouraging the person with that free and clear free and real estate to go and maybe put a home equity line of credit on it, mm. maybe to refinance it with a mortgage. And they'll be like, what? I just paid that off. No, don't go take the money and go to Hawaii with it. Take the money and put it into a real estate opportunity yeah. that produces cash flow. Now, this is what I said before about the mortgage documents have to be completely different, right? For real estate investment in your business, in your business, you need to make them monthly payments because they need those monthly payments to service the debt that they have, right? Right. Yeah. You don't want you're kind of setting them up for failure if you're costing them a monthly payment so they can be in your deal. So don't put them into a syndication. Don't put them in anything else. Borrow the money at a flat rate of return with a flat check going. Why, back. why wouldn't I put them into? It's obvious for you and I, but why would I put not not put them into syndication? Because people watch. Well, wait, syndications. There's a pref, a six six seven percent pref. Okay, going back to debt and equity, right? Debt is an obligation to make a specific monthly payment over a period of time, right? I'll say it again to make sure you guys caught that. Debt is a, is a obligation to make a specific monthly payment over a period of time or defer that monthly payment until the very end, right? But it's whatever the number is, 7%, 8%, 9%, right? Equity is an ownership of upside. It's direct ownership of the asset. It is connection to the ups of the property mm -hmm. and also maybe the downs. And a lot of times in multifamily these days, a lot of multifamilies that we buy might not produce very much money at all the first year or two worth of ownership. And so although you might tell an investor that you're going to produce a 6 7% rate of return, you can't guarantee that you're going to be able to make that monthly payment. You are setting them up for failure if that money's costing them five, six percent on their end, and you're quoting you're gonna pay them eight, and they're gonna make a nice healthy little yield spread in between, except for when you can't. Yep. Except for when the tenants don't pay their rent. Yep. You know, except for when things are down. If it's debt, you figure it out. You gotta go get that eight percent from some from somewhere out of your own pocket or whatever to keep making that monthly payment or you're in default, right? Debt is what you want with recurring monthly payments if they're if, if what's behind it is real estate debt. So if I've got um, one of the things I did through the book is, you know, going through and listing my, basically my money list. Mm -hmm. And I look through my, my phone. I remember doing this when I read the book, I go through my phone. I was like, 
I have like five million dollars in here. And I would what I would do is I would look at names of people and I go, I know you got 20 grand. Yeah. I know you got five grand. I know you got 10 grand. I know you got 30 grand. I know you got 50 grand. And I would go through and based on what I was learning in the book, I would text people and say, if I found a quality real estate investment, That's great. would you be open to potential? So they're, they don't even have to commit to me because I don't have a deal yet. Mm -hmm. But I also learned in the book, the time to raise money for a deal is before you have the deal. Too many people are running around. I mean, you probably gotten phone calls from students. Like, All the hey, time. I got to close in two weeks somebody, and I need another million dollars. Somebody, like somebody texted me yesterday and they said, I need $21 million. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to raise $21 million in the next eight days. Right. I sent him, I, so I sent him your Amazon link and I was like, I have told you to read this book. The time to raise money for a deal is before you have the yeah. deal. I feel for people like that. I'm not, I'm not judging. It is what it is. And I sure hope and pray that they figure their way around it. But at the end of the day, guys, please don't be that. Don't have that. that that's probably a hard lesson about to get learned. They're probably going to lose yeah. EMD. They're probably going to either have to negotiate a really expensive extension with the seller, um, or they may lose their, their earnest money deposit, or maybe somebody else's the, earnest the money deposit. The good thing, I think they're going to lose some ego, right? Their yeah. ego is going to get beat up a little bit. I bet. But they're going to get their EMD back, which is which is going to be great because they have an inspection period on it, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to raise twenty one million dollars in eight days." Yeah, they might lose a relationship with that broker. That broker will never do business with them ever again. Sending them a deal that size, mm -hmm. okay. But you also felt the pressure of, "Oh my gosh, I need twenty one million dollars." Yeah, and the vacancy of the relationships that you don't you had not built. Yeah. So now yeah. you're going to go forward and go, "I should be looking for deals and raising capital simultaneously." Yes. Your reputation is what you got, guys. You know, um, and so build your uh, money network first. As Pace just said, it's exactly what you guys should be doing. Build your money list and send out those text messages. Hey, if I produce a deal, whatever, and you'll find out real quick who your real interested investors are. Some may say yes. Uh, you, you know, like I, actually, I don't have the pace. I, you wrote, I, this person probably has 30K. You might find out they have like 230K, oh, right? Yeah. That's just sitting there. Uh, or the best conversation I've had is, I only got like 25 grand. And they get into a conversation with them. Well, didn't she used to work at, you know, Wells Fargo? Mm -hmm. And now you, oh yeah, yeah, I've got that retirement account and that's got like 300,000 in oh. it. But I, but I can't put that into real estate. I didn't know I can't, right. And this is the biggest <laughs> thing. Well, I can't do anything with that. That's just sitting there. That's got to be in the stock market, right? So you'll, you'll have plenty of those conversations. Don't always remember to ask folks what they have in their retirement accounts from, from prior jobs. Some of them forget. Oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, I do. Like, oh yeah, there is $80,000 sitting there. They forget they've got like 80 grand amazing? just sitting right, right, right. It must be like in their mind that it's not real money because they've never really had to touch it. Yes, that's the thing. It's not, it's money they've never had to manage. It's money they don't have to touch, but you can make your investors in charge of the financial future and really better their lives. Because I can tell you, Vanguard's probably not gonna double it up every couple of years like you can. No, I mean, I, I was talking to the uh, gentleman at Horizon Trust, a, a guy that I send over for self-directed. Again, a mm -hmm. lot of this stuff I just learned from your book. And he was talking about how the average investor is, is losing money in their retirement account yeah. because obviously of inflation. Yeah. If you're not making five to 6% a year minimum, you're mm -hmm. losing money in your retirement account. Yeah. He said something like $4 trillion is unused in people's retirement accounts that could be rolled over into self -tary. $4 trillion. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's mm -hmm. no way that's possible. So what's even more interesting about that number, which is true, by the way, uh, about 96% of that money is in some sort of a Wall Street vehicle, right? Doing in very retirement little account. for them. Doing very little, right? Uh, so there's trillions, guys, with a T like this, trillions of dollars of, of money that's sitting there could, that could legally be put into our real estate transactions. 4% of that of that of those trillions is involved in anything else but a Wall Street, right? And that includes oil and gas, uh, you know, gold investments, commodities, those kinds of things, and real estate. 4%. Well, what if people like myself and Pace and you can make that number five, six, or yeah. seven? It unlocks literally billions with a B of money. And what if we could put billions in the real estate industry and real equity to help us create real change and employ, and employ 59 people every time we do a house? Yeah, for yeah. real. So I, what I learned from the book, by the way, guys, um, new version of the book is coming out on July what? Uh, July 27th is what I saw on Amazon. So and July 27th, guys. You can pre-order. You can pre-order on bigger pockets. You can pre-order it on Amazon too. It's one of the few books that I think every real estate investor, no matter who, what your avatar is in real estate, whether you're a real estate agent, all the way down to a transaction coordinator, 
even transaction coordinators can benefit from reading this book because transaction coordinators deal with private money lenders, creating notes and all these kind of things, secondary their second lien positions and promissory notes and all that kind of stuff. Raising Private Capital is one of the books that every single person trying to get into real estate should read as one of their first books in mm -hmm. real estate. I encourage my investors to read it because I want them to get an idea of our mindset and the way that we look at things. And I've had folks that read the book thinking that they wanted to raise money and be like, hey, you know what? I actually am really inspired by what's possible. They want to get you know, I, I want to invest. You know, and these guys, <laughs> these folks have become like heavy in the eye quadrant of real yeah. estate investing, you know? And one more thing in the, in the new version of the book, there's a new chapter written by me as well. It's a long chapter. It's a much, it's a much thicker book now. I'm looking yeah, at. I can tell. It's much larger. It's like a good fifteen percent larger. Yeah, yeah. Because the last chapter is like four thousand words. Because I had a lot to say. <laughs> so the bigger pockets don't let me write one more chapter. What, so what okay, changed gonna... between writing this book five, six years ago and this book that's coming out now? Well, I had to update everyone on. Uh, it, it was funny when I wrote Raising Private Capital. We had a major, major setback happen. You probably remember at the at the very end of the book. Now this had just happened. And I still was dealing with the battle wounds from it. Um, my wife and I had eight hundred thousand dollars, seven hundred and sixteen thousand, but who's counting? Uh, a dollar stolen from us through a Ponzi scheme that was being run by a ten thirty one exchange intermediary. Okay, so we had sold an eighteen unit with a group of investors and us. And we rolled it up into a 1031 exchange company. And that money was supposed to go into a 198 unit apartment building that we were buying down in North Carolina, right? Uh, that money was stolen. And so in Raising Private Capital, the last chapter, chapter nine, I talk about, hey, listen, just so you know, guys, this business can punch back very, very hard. And that's how I got the gray hairs. That's how I got the <laughs> battle scars, whatever it is, but I stayed in the ring, right? And so I wanted folks to know, and that's how I concluded the book. Like, just so you guys know, the key to success in this business is getting back in the ring when you take an uppercut, right? Um, but in chapter 10, I was able to update folks. Guess what? We got it back, you know? Yeah, well, we weren't the only ones that got taken by this guy. He had, uh, he had at the time of, the, of, of all this mess, uh, he had absconded with 6.5 million of other people's money. Wow. Right? Yeah, just so many bad actors. The audacity yeah. of somebody thinking you're not gonna get caught. Yeah, you're right. Well. Some of the money went to bad stuff that somebody stealing 6.5 million would do with it, let's just say, to keep it PG. But he also was maybe stupid, maybe smart enough. He thought that this is what he was going to do to get himself out. He bought like 70 houses. Mm -hmm. He bought several mobile home parks, bought himself a million dollar home on the beach, right? And so... By him doing that, he then had assets mm. that could then uh, get be, gone out. Be liquidated and yeah. sold and get the money back. So we assembled all the other people that were involved in the 6.5 million. Now, we were number three on the list. There was a number one person that was over a million, number two, and then we were number, we, were, we were third place at $716,000. Wow. And everybody else down the list. So we assembled all these folks and hired a lawyer and did ourselves a class action suit. Um, and after years of, uh, going back and forth with court, uh, and, and, you know, he folded immediately, wife left him. Is he going right to prison? Away. You know, that was part of the negotiation because we got almost all the money back. And so he got, he got away. He air quote got away with this whole thing. Amazing. You know, because of, uh, right. I know. And he's, you know, doing his thing. So whatever. this story's in the new book. That story's in the new book. And the biggest thing here, guys, that I talk about in the new book is, uh, what I've learned how to do in the years since I've raised, it's been five years since I wrote the book. We've learned how to go next level and to go more professional and to like become, there's a book called Turning Pro, uh, Stephen R. Pressfield. I've not read that. I fantastic read that. book. Um, and it's really about like going from being an amateur into a pro, right? Um, and in raising, in the next version of Raising Private Capital, I talk about what it is like to quite poking at this business with a stick and, and what it is to build, to build a real corporate empire. Not that, you know, you want to have a full-time job, but to do this thing, to quit treating real estate like it's a hobby and to start running real estate like it's a full-fledged business, which we, what's, that's what we've wanted to do over the last five years. So we give a lot of tools and concepts that we think folks need to do. If you guys want to learn how to raise capital on a larger level or just operate you know, in a more sustainable professional fashion. And I'm not saying get in a scenario where you're working 60, 70 hours a week. I'm not trying to create more work for you guys to do. I'm trying to teach you guys in the new version of Raising Private Capital how to do this in a more sustainable, you know, help more people's lives, create more, th create more goodness for more people, help more investors, do more of it on a larger scale, and also live life on your own terms. 
Here's a couple of weird questions for you. Bring it. I wonder if you guys have implemented any sort of AI into your raising capital, uh, mm -hmm. meaning maybe you guys have a list, your investor relation department has a list of investors. Have you guys implemented any so sort of like constant communication with them that's automatic drip of, hey, we don't, have a, we don't currently have a deal right now, but here's what's going on with the, the past deals, or mm -hmm. is there any AI that you've been able to implement yet? So we do the newsletter and email drips and hey, this is how it's going and everything like that, and it's tough to find deals these days, so we just stay in front of our investors, hey, this is what we're up to. Um, AI, we do use AI. I use AI on a lot of our social media mm. because I found that AI can write things better for SEO optimization than you or I could. Ever, you and I are yeah. kind of just guessing on like, oh, oh yeah. writing stuff up. Well, a, a, you know, AI knows how to, you know, what SEO optimization, like what the best way to optimize a phrase is or a sentence or a video description or something like that. So we use AI quite a bit on the social media side. Um, I've thought about doing the AI email stuff to write, send communications to people using AI. Um, we are using AI to research markets Ooh, as well. Okay. So uh, I was with one of our students and um, he wanted us to look at Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? I knew nothing about Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne, Indiana, so I went into chat GPT. And I said, why is Fort Wayne, Indiana a great place to invest? And it went, and it told me all these different things. And I read all of it. And then you know what I did? Why is Fort Wayne, Indiana a bad place to invest oh, in real estate? Yeah, just and it, it goes, and so I put those two next to each other. And I said, okay, let's compare notes oh. as to what AI has to say as to why this market is good, you know? Um, and it was it was really interesting conversation that we had with ChatGPT. And we, you know, can you elaborate on that? Or tell me more about the industries coming into Fort Wayne, Indiana, you know, and stuff like that. Love so, it. Okay, yeah. so what has changed in the raising capital environment mm -hmm. since you wrote the book last. New laws, new regulations, new mm -hmm. strategies of finding private money lenders that you've adopted. Mm -hmm. Any Anything new that's changed since the book came out five years I mean, ago? We systematize a lot of it. Where I, where I think the hockey puck's going, and it's not quite there yet, is the use of things like blockchain technology, uh, the use of tokenization, Currently, I don't believe tokenization is the right answer for raising private capital. I, people yeah. were throwing it out 24 months ago, and I was like, I think the adoption of that's going to take six to eight more years. Well, the SEC, whether what it is or not, the SEC needs to get in the middle of that. And right. there's no way I'm going to go and take on tokenization as a means to get around the SEC. Yeah. The government's... They're not stupid, but they're slow. And right. it'll take them time to figure out that people are doing it and because there are people out there using tokenization to avoid registering folks with the SEC or registering your deals of five. Because they're basically saying, buy my NFT. Yeah. And you'll get as a bonus, you'll get an ownership share in this thing over here. Yeah. That comes with the NFT. Yeah. Or like you know, I'm going to invest in Pace's deal. And so instead of me giving Pace a dollar, I'm going to go get on this portal and I'm going to pay a dollar and I get a token. Right, and then that token is what I bought. Like that's my transaction with with real yeah. U.S. currency, right? right? And then I'm going to take that token and through blockchain a blockchain firewall, it's gonna it's gonna make it anonymous, whatever. And then I'm going to take my token number two three five seven, and I'm going to take that token and buy equity in in Pace's deal, right? Mm -hmm. That's the conversation that's being had. And people are still people are doing this. Sure. I, they are, but here's the problem, right? The SEC has been very, very vocal about the, the their they will not allow Bitcoin for law or Bitcoin or any type of crypto to be long term me a means to hide from the SEC. They will find a way to regulate it. They will find a way to to see through that. Now you can do it today, but would do you really want to be owning an apartment building in year three or year four when the SEC comes down the pipe and says, okay, we now require that within thirty days you disclose who are your investors are, or we're going to throw you a fine, oh, yeah. right? Okay, I, I don't want to be on the other end of that. And what if they say, okay, well, this person was not accredited. They put $500 into your deal and you didn't abide by the 506B rules and you put a non-accredited into your real estate. And I'm sorry, I, I'm speaking in total French to some of you guys right now. Not to read my book. I talk all about 506B, 506C, and there's a lot you guys can learn about this kind of stuff in, in the book and whatnot. But Understand this, that there are rules in how non-accredited can get put into deals. People can, that are non-accredited, invest with me or right. with Pace. It's possible. But don't try and get around the rules yeah. through something that hasn't been fully formed and regulated yet, like NFTs and tokens and that kind of stuff. You know, The environment of raising capital now is probably pretty simple to get money 
but deploying it into deals right now is a little challenging. Yes. Is that correct? That's the problem, right? Um, so we are, we, my primary uh, vehicle that we offer people is apartment buildings. Um, I've done uh, lots of private loans. I've done Burr strategy deals or whatever, and we've graduated into larger real estate projects. Um, but it's very hard to find multifamily that makes sense these days, right? Yeah, it's the yeah. Whole, it's, it seems like the whole multifamily space is at a standstill. There's like a stalemate going on where there's some impending issues with some debt, underlying debt in other people's businesses. And there's people on the sidelines waiting for these things to happen. People are not, it, it's the weirdest, it's weird mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And so your guys' acquisition, acquisition department, I imagine is like, I guess we're just kind of a wait and hold pattern. <laughs> yeah, well, we keep throwing, we keep throwing offers out, you know, uh, and waiting for opportunities to make sense. We've actually gotten into building. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got two apartment buildings coming out of the ground right now. If you can't find the deal, build the deal. I'll build the deal. Uh, and it employs a lot of people, which we're all about, uh, but it also allows me to control cost. Um, I can say, okay, I can build it for this and not for nothing. A lot of apartment buildings these days are selling just a few smidges under replacement cost. Right. Well, it's like, well, why wouldn't I pay 15% more I can have it all brand new, up right. to new codes and new fa new fancy backsplashes and new this, new that, right? So we're gravitating a little bit towards new construction. Um, we're also getting into hard money loans, uh, which I know you're involved in already as well. And I believe that not like eight different flavors of ice cream diversification that you guys should be offering to your investors, but in this day and age, it's important to have, let's say two or three different flavors of ice yeah. cream you can offer your investors. That if you want cash flow, short-term yields, this is what I have for you. If you want this type of vehicle, you know, the longer range upside, whatever it is, maybe you put them into an apartment building that's not going to pay them very much for the first year or two or not pay them anything for the first couple of years. But it's a good, safe shelter to put uh, to put money. America still needs tons more housing, you know. And so apartment buildings are not going to get cut in half. The multifamily market is not going to crash because we need more housing in this country. So it's going to be stable. It just might be stagnant for a long time. And I think that's what's going to happen for the multifamily is it's just going to be the stalemate that we're going to have the Mexican standoff oh, yeah. for a while for multifamily and maybe transactions go way down and sellers that need to sell are going to sell. So there's yep. some distress sales, as you said, debt comes around. Oh yeah. But a lot of folks don't need to sell. I mean, yeah. I've got buildings that have seven year financing on them that, you know, I got a seven year rate lock. I'm not going to sell anytime soon. Yeah. You're holding on to that. Yeah. I'm going to hold it. You know? So if, if I'm somebody that is just starting out, yeah, I, I got to read the book. Obviously, the book changed my life. It really has, and I, I bring it up all the time to people. Like, hey guys, it's a great, Thank it's a so great much. book to get started. Um, it's a great book to read multiple times as you graduate yourself. There's a lot of terms that you won't understand the first time you hear it, but wel <laughs> welcome to learning anyth anything new. What I would say is it is the ultimate superpower to, is to know how to raise private capital. Yeah, because. Um, somebody told me after I read the book, I was. They asked me, "What do you wish you would have?" People ask you this all the time, mm -hmm. Matt, if you could start back over all over again, what would yeah. you do different? Yeah. And my answer always is I would have learned how to raise capital way faster. Mm. And they go, oh, it's because of the golden rule. And I'm like, what's the golden rule? He who do, do under others as you would have them do unto you. And I go, no, 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 not the golden rule your mom taught you. Yeah. The golden rule is he who controls the gold yeah. makes the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning I don't even have to be the guy who owns the gold. Yeah. Meaning I can control my grandfather's gold, my friend's gold or whatever. And that's people right. just bring deals to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And if you've got, uh, it, it, once you get, no, you be, make yourself known in your communities that you can raise capital, as Pace said, people are going to bring opportunities to them. Pace and I both get opportunities brought to us regularly. We're doing an opportunity right now in San Antonio, 104 unit apartment building. You know, Pace gets plenty of opportunities brought to him as well because we built a structure and a business around raising money. Now, I'm not going to just raise money for a fee and go away. I, I've also built the other parts of the business as well, operations and structures and culture and those kinds of things. So if I'm doing the deal, we're going to absorb it into the amoeba of the DeRosa right. group and it's going to be a part of our a part of our fold. But I can make that deal happen. You guys can build that too. There's no like, you know, secret that Pace and I have aside from just understanding that money is, is a lot more prevalent and a lot more around us than you guys think it is. I do have a secret. The secret is I read your book. <laughs> um, second thing is in the book, I do realize after I started sending out text messages to people, this was, this was the thing I believe I had as a misconception that the book corrected for me was, um, I don't have to have a deal to raise money. Yes. I mean, I'm not going to take their money until I have the deal, 
But it's a, I've heard people doing that. That's a terrible it's mistake. Terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that. But getting people to go, yeah, if you find a deal, I'd love to be a part of it. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I did. This is the first thing I did to start raising money. I had buddies of mine that were doing fix and flips. I was a contractor primarily at the time. So I would go to my buddies fix and flips that I was doing the renovations on. Mm -hmm. And I would go, Hey, can I use your house as the backdrop of a quick 30 second video to potentially raise some money? And my buddy's like, yeah, of course. So I would record a video and I'd say, Hey, this house just got flipped. And the person who flipped it is making this much money. The private money lender on the deal is making this much money on a mm -hmm. monthly basis. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for opportunities to buy like this, mm -hmm. but I need people who have capital. Yeah. If I found a deal like this, would you be interested in investing with me? Mm -hmm. And I, it's a 30 second video. Mm -hmm. And I would send it out to people in my message. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden I get people pinging me back. Yeah, I've got 50 grand. Yeah, I got a hundred grand. I'm like, I've got commitments on money before I even have a deal. Yeah. It gives you a lot more courage though, doesn't it? I mean, for you guys watching, maybe you're not making the offer on the deal that you think is a phenomenal deal because you're not sure where the money's going to come from. Mm -hmm. So what if you turn the conversation around? Go find the money first. The, the level of confidence and the level of courage you're going to have in talking to brokers and looking at deals, because the broker's always like, well, where, where's your money going to come from? I've already got a half million committed. So yes. can you, will you show me the deal now, right? That you know, is a, that's a great yeah. point. When I j jumped into yeah. multifamily, um, it was really interesting. The multifamily brokers are like, how much money do you have already raised? And I go, oh, well, I don't have any raised, but once I get it under contract, then I'll raise. And they yeah. go, uh-uh. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're not gonna get we're not gonna go under contract with you if you don't have commitments on your capital yet. Yeah. Like, wow, it is so important to raise the money beforehand. So yeah. um, guys, this book is unbelievable. I haven't read the new one, so I'm super excited to, to have this. It's coming out in July. Yes. Can they pre-order it now? They can. They can go to biggerpockets.com forward slash store, or they can go on Amazon and uh, they can check out the new release of it as well that's coming out in July as well. Guys, I would I would go to Amazon. Nothing against Bigger Pockets. I love Bigger Pockets, but Amazon is easier um, to to get the book through. I, that's what I was experienced with mm -hmm. with mine. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it seems like Bigger Pockets wants people to go through Amazon. Or is that right? I th well, they there are some bonuses and that kind of thing like, through uh, their website. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like if they, if you buy your book through, uh, through Amazon, do they get the bonuses that you came up with? Yeah. The videos do. and that kind of stuff. They do. So it didn't matter to okay. them. Yeah. Um, but so where, where would you want people to buy the book? Either one guys, uh, Amazon or bigger pockets. Uh, I, I think bigger pockets is maybe somewhat agnostic either way to where you, to where you, are you doing with. an audio book? I am, but I, I, I didn't, did you read your audio? Did you I read did. your book? It yeah. sucks. Yeah. I do. Did I do not, not so much? We, yeah. it took us three days. <laughs> Eric and I did it. And um, actually, I was a month late on my deadline. Okay. And I grew a, a higher level of respect for people that write books after I wrote my book. Yeah. It's a lot harder than people think it is. I know it is. Guys, writing a book is extremely difficult. Now, sitting and reading your book in a studio, I think, is 10x more difficult. So uh, you can buy the audio version of it. It is not read by me. Forgive me for that. It's read by a professional person who knows how to read things really well and has a really good reading voice. Uh, and that's so it's not me reading the book, but it is there is an audio and a Kindle version of it as well. So guys, um, while we're all about believing in um, people who bring us value, so go buy the book. Link is down below. Make sure you support. The book is, um, I, what it's probably going to be 26 bucks, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. 20, 26 yeah, bucks. Whatever the price is, it's underpriced. <laughs> okay. It's underpriced. For me, this book yeah. brought me millions of dollars in value. Um, hundreds, uh, I will raise hundreds of millions of dollars in my lifetime, maybe even over a billion dollars total from the foundation, the pillar that I got from this book. Mm -hmm. So I thank you so much for, for hanging out and, and talking about the book is, this book is there, do you feel like there's anything you miss when you write your books? Like, cause there's, let's see how you got basically 200 pages. Yeah. As somebody who has so much wisdom about, about raising capital, mm -hmm. you finish the book mm -hmm. and you go, I wish I could have put this in the book and fit it in there. Or do you feel like you got it all in there? Well, I'm grateful that I got another shot to add to it, right? Mm, because yeah. books are static in that sense, which is why it's important uh, to, for those of you guys that want to create media to be have constant conversations with your base through YouTube, through Instagram, through whatever it is you want to do, LinkedIn, um, because you want to have continued conversations with people because the, the brain doesn't, the, the brain keeps producing ideas, right? And so I'm grateful that I got another crack at writing uh, another chapter for the book because 
because and that's why the chapter is so long. It's not a lot to say, right? And so I'm hoping that can be a uh, another revised edition years down the road that I can add to again. Maybe we'll talk. Maybe they finally figure out the crypto thing or they oh, find, yeah. you know, the tokenization, right? Um, another vision I have one day that I talked about. I got to talk about this in the book um, is how it is my dream one day for the for me to buy an apartment building and for the tenants in the apartment building to own a little piece of it. Not not for me to grant it to them, but what if you and I could figure out a way for our tenants to like, okay, my rent's a thousand dollars a month. Got it. Here's my thousand dollars a month to pay for my living expenses. Here's two hundred dollars a month that I'm buying a piece of the real of the yeah, place that cool. I live. Right. That'd be cool. Well, like. That when that single mom, you know, you know, when when her kid graduates high school, maybe there's like thirty grand yeah. sitting in real estate equity that could get capitalized to send the kid to college, right? And maybe she'd never have to move. Maybe she can live there for the rest of her life, and we can create a better living environment and help people raise their financial game. That's something I talk about in the book. But what I'd like to have is to actually do something like that, and then That's okay, here's cool the script. idea. Here's how I did it. Right, so I got his wheels turning. You guys see this? That's yeah. a really cool <laughs> idea. Okay, uh, final question: If you could write another book other than raising capital, yeah. What else are you passionate about that you would go write another book about? And uh, so I'm beginning the journey. Uh, you guys know my wife, Liz Faircloth, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the Real Estate Invest Her, uh, which is the community there building financial wherewithal for women. Uh, my wife and I are beginning the journey on talking to, and writing a book, about halfway done the book, on how to invest with your spouse. Uh, because so many people that are active out there in the real estate community, either one spouse is active and running the day-to-day -day of the business, the other one is like the best cheerleader ever for that wow. person and helping them out and you know whatever they need. And many, many husband and wife combos, you and I know that are either in our student bases or whatever, are you know the, the right arm and the left arm of the business, the husband and wife. Yep. The wife's out there finding deals, the husband's raising the capital, a lot of times the husband's browbeating the contractors or vice versa, whatever it is. Um, and so we want to write a playbook for couples that are working together. And so, so good. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's will likely be the next book that I have my name on. So good. I mean, yeah. I, we get a lot of husbands that come into our world with YouTube or whatever that are like, how do I get my wife to support me? And I say, get your wife involved in the business, paint a vision, how she can apply herself to your business and actually mm -hmm. amplify and build the kingdom. Stop trying and building the kingdom on your own and then coming yeah. home and not talking to her about it. Yeah go build it together and it's a lot more fun and you'll have a lot more connectivity. I love that you guys are actually writing that book the, right now. The way you guys do it, by the way, uh, is you get your wife or your husband enrolled and excited in the life that this entrepreneur vehicle is going to create for you, right? So let's talk about what life will look like five years from now once we've got X amount of doors, once we've done these business ventures or whatever, like what will life look like? What what journey, what will our reality be? And you get the buy-in, like, yeah, maybe we live somewhere different. Maybe we both drive better cars. I don't know, whatever it is you think life's gonna look like, better vacations, better cars, better reality, saving up more for the kids to go to college, whatever it is you both, your, you and your spouse are super passionate about, get very clear that that road to what you want can be driven with real estate or with entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. And that's the way to create the biggest raving fan. Hey, how can I help? I wanna be a part of this, because I want that. I want, the, I want to be at that finish line journey on where this thing's gonna take us, right? It's, I've seen too many spouses try and drag the other spouse, kicking and screaming, and oh, I'm not interested in real estate. Well, I get it, they're not. But look at real estate as a vehicle to get you what you really want in life, right? you know? Love that, so you've got Raising private capital, the refresh is coming out July 2.0. 2. 2. Yeah. So uh, yeah. guys, go pick up this book. It changed my life. I talk about it all the time. I've been talking about it for three, four, five years, how this book is the book that helped me get started in raising private capital, raise millions and millions of dollars, do a lot of deals. And then um, go and subscribe to Matt's what, uh, YouTube channel. YouTube channel, uh, derosagroup.com is our website. Yeah, and to just go to YouTube and look up Derosa Group. We put out content several times a week. And it's really just forward-facing uh, in, in investor-level conversations with folks on how to um, build your brand. It's really made for active operators on how to build a better business. Love it, brother. Thank you so much for joining me. You're the man. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. We'll yes, see you face. in the next video. Do not forget to buy the book. The link will be down below. Um, and then also, your wife... Liz Faircloth, mm -hmm. 
where can people find out about the upcoming book there? Is it just, we got to wait? The real estate invest, it's only halfway done. So we'd only be able come to- Come on, yeah. I know, right? You can send me those, come on, Matt, uh, messages <laughs> at DeRose at, at the Rose Group website. And we could use some encouragement from our community uh, to get the work done. Liz and I need to just hunker down, maybe go put ourselves in a cabin yes. somewhere and just finish that book uh, so we can get it out to you guys to make a difference. Thanks again, so. brother. Guys, pick, go pick up the book. Matt Faircloth, Raising Private Capital, Bigger Pockets, amazing partner of his. Link in the description down below. We'll see you in another video.